The Senate Health and Human Services Committee back to order. We do have a quorum. So we will uh, continue with Senate File 2265. Senator Wickland, to your bill. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Senate File 2265 is a bill that reflects um, the urgency of providing some funding for uh, a few different source or a few different entities to address the uh, work that is going to begin or has been already ongoing, but the, the main work will begin in about a month um, having to do with the, the PHE unwind. And I, uh, when we had the presentation by DHS back a few weeks ago, about the work that would be going on from now until um, next summer to, re, um, to reassess and um, take in the people who are still qualified or keep still qualified for medical assistance and Minnesota care um, and also alert people who are not qualified. Um, they had indicated that they would need some additional funding um, and they would appreciate being able to have that um, early. And so this bill is intended to provide some of that funding in a uh, more expedited manner so that they can have that available to them. Um, I do have an amendment that is the A2 amendment, which we'll pass out now, which um, makes some substantial changes to the bill. And so I'll go through um, how it how it changes the bill. Uh, the bill as introduced um, has some features that we didn't feel, or, or I didn't feel are necessary to move forward right now. Um, I wanna keep this to be um, items that are needed by the Department of Human Services as well as um, some other entities, the counties and some navigators will need as they do this work. And if we're going to um, put it forward earlier in session, I want it to be the, the money that's you know, actually needed early. Um, so what the, the um, amendment does is that it, it removes um, section one, which has to do with some cost sharing, cost sharing re reductions. Um, and we're, we're, it's not something that we need to deal with right now immediately. Um, it also removes section two, which would, um, would have put in place uh, continuous enrollment for 12 months for, some, for children. Um, again, uh, we're thinking that that isn't something that we need to take on. It's something that we would like to accomplish this session, but um, not immediately. Um, it leaves in place section three, which has to do with um, some waiver uh, modifications and language that DHS um, believes is needed. So that stays in place. It leaves in place section four, which is also language that uh, provides direction um, and I could have DHS maybe could explain this better, um, what section four is doing. Um, it t removes section five, but then it replaces, um, replaces the appropriation section with a, a new section basically. And then it removes the bills section six because that has to do with the cost sharing reduction subsidies. Um, so in section three, in the author's amendment, you'll see an appropriation that um, basically the items that are funded go to DHS for work that they're doing. Also, there's funding for grants to navigators because the navigators haven't had as much work because there's not the, the, the turnover and re-enrollment of people. Um, and we have a testifier who can speak more to their need. And then there's funding that um, would go to counties. Uh, the counties have a significant amount of work um, coming up to deal with this um, transition. 
And so this includes funding for counties and we do have a testifier to speak more to that. So um, if we could adopt the A2 amendment and then, or if you have questions about what I just presented. Senator Abler. Well, uh, thank you, Madam Chair and Senator Wickham. I like this amendment. This is turning the bill into something I could vote for. The earlier one was a little more problematic. So thank you. And I presume you're going to discuss uh, your section three, your new section three. So I, I'm happy to vote for it. And th thank you for taking out some of the parts that I think should wait, like you said. So thank you. Okay. Senator Wickland. Um, no, if we could adopt the amendment and then we have... I think four people who will testify and they can talk more specifically about the different, different aspects of the bill. So Senator Wicklin moves the A2 amendment. Uh, so all those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed? All right, the uh, motion passes and the amendment is adopted. All right. And if we could uh, go to the testifiers, I don't have the list, but if you could call them it. Very good, yes, we will move to testifiers. So first on my list is Carrie Wiemet. Uh, and next will be Stephanie Radke. Welcome to the committee. Please introduce yourself and proceed. Good evening, Madam Chair and committee members. My name is Carrie Wiemet, and I am the Economic Assistance Director at Scott County. And I'm here tonight representing the Minnesota Association of County Social Service Administrators, or MAXA. As you might know, counties have the responsibility for the majority of the resident-facing work for the unwinding process for healthcare renewals for the medical assistance program. We very much appreciate the legislature's acknowledgement of this increased workload. I'd like to share briefly what the process looks like from the county perspective. To start, the renewal process will start as a completely manual and paper-based process. DHS continues to work on ways to create the expedited process, but we aren't quite there yet. Eligibility determination and maintenance of medical assistance cases are done in two different eligibility systems, which increases complexity and staff training time. One of the systems currently does not give counties access to data that we input, so tracking and efficiency management is nearly impossible. The other system is 30 plus years old. It's a green screen mainframe, which works fine with our experienced workers who are used to using the system, but it's a pretty steep learning curve for our newer staff that have never seen this type of technology. And the start of this work for counties is imminent. Various communica communications campaigns are underway, for example, urging residents to contact their counties to update any contact information that has changed in the last three years. This pre-renewal pre work is critical to ensure that renewal paperwork will be delivered to the correct address and on time. Pre-renewal notices will start going out in April, and as we head into the first renewals that are due in July of this year, we will start dealing with not only case closures, but the churn of cases, the maintenance on those cases that are not renewing, and of course, all of the new applications that we will continue to receive and have to process. So needless to say, this flood of work will be difficult for us to manage. As we think about potential additions to our staffing complements, whether that be through temporary or permanent staffing, there are some challenges in this area too. Uh, for example, it can take up to a year to fully train an eligibility worker um, and develop those skills in our state-run computer systems. There are a lot of staff who have also joined um, counties in the eligibility realm um, since 2020, which means they have never been through a full renewal process. So this means we're also going to have to focus heavily on the retraining of staff um, and consider options like redeploying existing staff that have um, experiencing process renewals you know, prior to the pandemic um, in order to shift some of that workload. Um, counties, of course, are also committed to equity throughout this process. We want to be able to do the appropriate community outreach to ensure that all residents have access to services. And we also want to be sure that all residents understand the renewal process and what is expected of them knowing that this is critical to making sure that their healthcare access is maintained for the most, those most in need. Um, I am joined this evening by Matt Freeman, who is the Executive Director of MAXA, who can speak more to the methodology used for calculating costs to execute the continuous coverage unwind. Thank you so much for your time. 
and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you for your testimony, Ms. Wiemet. Um, Mr. Freeman, please introduce yourself for the record and proceed. Matt Freeman, Executive Director for the Minnesota Association of County Social Service Administrators and a Human Service Policy Analyst for the Association of Minnesota Counties. Um, included in your packet or handed out is a, a methodology or a sheet that shows a model of what that allocation would look like across the state uh, based on m uh, medical assistance um, totals from each county uh, and allocating it based on uh, those amounts. We worked to gather uh, feedback from counties across the state on what they had the capacity to use, what is appropriate, and uh, what they expected the increased enrollment and, and workloads to do. So happy to speak more to that, but want to thank um, Chair Wickland and the committee for considering this important appropriation. Thank you for your testimony, Mr. Freeman. Next, we will hear from Stephanie Radke. And after that, Chelsea Olson. Ms. Radke, welcome to the committee. Please introduce yourself for the record and proceed with your testimony. Stephanie Radke, uh, President, Portico Health Net. Good evening, Madam Chair, members of the committee. Um, I am here on behalf of the 21 navigator organizations that signed the navigator letter. Um, that hopefully is in your packets or, and has been posted. I want to thank you for the opportunity to share the challenges Minnesota's community-based navigator organizations face as we move forward with the ending of the public health emergency and the unwinding of continuous coverage for Minnesota health care programs. Up to one in four Minnesotans will be required to renew their public program coverage over the next 14 months and we expect unprecedented demand on community navigator organizations, uh, local county processing agencies, and our health systems. Creating a coordinated and adequately funded approach will be essential to reducing unnecessary gaps in coverage, increasing equity and access, and reaching those most in need of assistance. A robust and effective statewide navigator network will be the front line of the healthcare coverage re-enrollment effort. Navigators are trusted community members who are often members of underserved communities, speak the nat native languages of our neighbors, and ensure culturally aware services. Our outreach and application assistance results in greater awareness of program benefits and requirements, more complete applications to local county processing agencies, and overall increased program enrollment. Unfortunately, the pandemic and inflation has negatively impacted many navigator organizations and funding has been stagnant. The continuous coverage granted to enrollees during the COVID-19 pandemic has led to significant decreases in incentive payments to ensure navigator organizations who depend on these payments to support our work. All certified navigator organizations are eligible for incentive payments or per enrollee, per enrollee payments. Um, for each person, they successfully assist in submitting an application um, or required program renewal. As a result of the decrease in per enrollee, enrollee payments, many navigator organizations have had to lay off staff and reduce capacity. We want to thank uh, Senator Wickland for moving this bill quickly and for the navigator funding that is included in the appropriation. Authorizing the disbursement of this year's incentive funds that were already allocated for navigator incentive payments will allow navigator organizations to build capacity and prepare for the ending of the public health emergency. This funding in this bill, which we are very grateful for, will help us prepare for the unwinding but in our letter, we also ask for an increase in the incentive payment from $70 to $100 with the built-in cost of living adjustment and an overall annual base grant funding increase from $4 million to $10 million during the continuous coverage and winding and the ongoing base grant increase from $4 million to $7 million with the built-in cost of living adjustment. We hope these additional funding requests can be considered, can be considered as part of um, the overall health and human services budget discussions. These requests will support the long-term sustainability of community-based navigator organizations and reflect the cost of doing this work. As noted earlier, a robust statewide network of navigators will be a critical community partner and ensure a smooth end to the public health emergency and continued health care coverage for low-income Minnesotans. 
Thank you for your consideration. Thank you for your testimony, Ms. Radke. Um, Chelsea Olson, please introduce yourself and proceed. Thank you, Madam Chair, members of the committee. My name is Chelsea Olson with the Minnesota Council of Health Plans. It's the nonprofit um, trade association. It's the trade association for the nonprofit health plans in Minnesota. That's Blue Cross and Blue Shield in Minnesota, Health Partners, Hennepin Health, Medica, Sanford Health Plan, and UCARE. Eighty-four percent of Minnesotans on public programs are um, served by council plan members. As such, we understand the challenges associated with resuming eligibility checks after a three-year pause and the significant impact that redeterminations will have on plan enrollees. To help support Minnesotans through this process, council plans have been working collaboratively with DHS, Minsher, county and tribal agencies, as well as other stakeholders for nearly two years to help plan for the end of the continuous coverage mandate. Our shared goal is that no one experiences an avoidable gap in coverage. And we, uh, and we um, are working to ensure that Minnesotans have continued access to affordable and timely care. As such, we support the provisions in Senator Wickland's bill here today, um, especially the inclusion of dedicated funding for counties, navigators, and agencies, including IT upgrades. Those are crucial elements to help make sure that the enrollment process is as simple and efficient as possible. We urge members to support this bill and to expedite its passage to maximize the impact of these additional resources. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony, Ms. Olson. Senator Wickland, any other comments? No, I hope members, if you, I mean, if you have more questions, um, I hope that the, pres the people who testified, they kind of laid out the reasons for um, why this funding is needed. Um, and then I would just emphasize that we are trying to do it in an expedited manner. And I'm um, sorry for getting the amendment created and out so late, but we, we want to have this bill move forward and move on to finance so it can be discussed in, in an expeditious manner, get it to the floor so that we could make the money available um, more quickly than the end of session. So but happy to answer okay. any other questions. Very good. Questions or discussion, members? Uh, Senator Liskey. Thank you, Madam Chair. I think the uh, one of the only questions we were asking for, obviously, with the changes is kind of where we're at on the fiscal note um, and kind of what, what our plans are there. That's, I think, what we were just wondering about, so. <laughs> Uh, so there is in your email, Senator Liskey and members, um, a spreadsheet with some of that information. Um, it is now on the website as well. Any other questions? I'm, so, I'm sorry, Senator Liskey, any follow-up? Okay. Um, seeing no other... Oh, just sorry. One more. Yeah, so just one more. Um, so is this part of the governor's planned budget in the DHS stuff, or what are our targets with this? I guess, what are we trying to do with this one? Senator Wickland. Well, um, this, most of this proposal, or a lot of it, came from um, the governor's proposal um, that it's included in his um, uh, budget pages that we, you know, we had just a highlight of that it was there. Um, there was, there's more detail. There are some additions. The uh, money designated for counties, that's an addition. And then the navigator funding is an addition to it. So. Um, it's kind of, it comes from the governor's proposal, though, originally. Um, in terms of budget targets, I mean, it, um, that would be to be determined in terms of how it impacts, whether it's the budget target for this committee or not. I think we're, um, we're just hoping that we can act on it more quickly and, and get the money allocated so that they can begin to make use of it as they do the work. Senator Liskey. Uh, last question, I guess, is uh, does this plan on going to another committee? Or are we laying it over here? Is this going to the floor? I guess that's my other only last question of what we were kind of already working towards. So, The next stop for this bill is the Finance Committee. That's correct. Madam okay. Chair, Thank Senator you. Liskey, that, that's correct. So with that, would you like to make a motion, Senator Wickland? 
Yes, I would move that Senate file 2265 as amended be recommended to pass and be referred to the Finance Committee. All those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed? All right, the uh, motion passes and the bill is on its way. Thank you, Madam Chair. All right, all right, I will hand the gavel back to Chair Wickland. Because you can. I think so. Uh, Senator Hoffman, thank you, thank you for presenting um, Senate way. File 1692. I'm glad I am because, you know, there's the, you're just going to focus on Section 20 of this bill for this committee because uh, apparently I, I uh, get the clone, not the clone. Anyway, it's got to come back to uh, the other committee you and I are on. So, right. Uh, so I just want to focus on uh, Senate File 1692, Section 20 is the HCBS Workforce Development Grant Modifications. It's a DHS agency bill and includes provisions in Section 20 that makes clarifications to existing grant programs that were passed in 2021 called the Home and Community Based Workforce Development Grant. The purpose of the grant is to help retain direct support professionals who provide supportive services to people with disabilities and older adults. There's a legislative report and an informational video in your packets, and it's posted on the committee page with additional information on the grant. Members want to learn more. So I basically, I have a bunch of whole bunch to go over, but I'm not going to. What I'm going to do is I'm going to just go to Christy Grom from the department to provide any additional comments and answer questions. And prior to that, just that you're currently waiting uh, Ms. Grom for passage of this provision before dispersing funds to direct support professionals. That is correct. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome to the committee, Ms. Grom. Um, please state your name and provide any testimony. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Christy Grom with the Department of Human Services. And it doesn't um, sound like either the mic is on or you're crossing it. Go ahead. Come over here. Are you sure? We were having problems, technical difficulties with one of the microphones, so. Get Radio Shack. Even in the new fancy Senate building. Um, thank you, Madam Chair members. Uh, Christy Grom with the Department of Human Services. So as Senator Hoffman mentioned, and thank you so much for presenting um, this bill on behalf of Senator May Quaid this evening, who is not able to be here. Um, this is a bill that's related to the, or a provision in this bill related to the HCBS Workforce Development Grant, which was passed in 2021, um, and in part with revenues from those um, HCBS enhanced FMAP dollars. Um, which uh, we sort of scrambled at the end of session to be able to figure out what the guidance was and how to use those revenues. And so um, in putting together this really important grant, um, we wanted to make sure that most of the funding went directly to people, direct support professionals, who are providing services on the front lines. Um, and we uh, made sure that 90% of the funding went directly to those professionals. Um, and then since there was sort of a rush to put this bill together, the legislature um, asked DHS to work with stakeholders and to really um, interact and identify those specific uses that we would allocate these funds to and report back in the legislative report. And so that's what's in um, your packets. The video, unfortunately, we couldn't post, but it's really cute, so you should watch it online and informational um, if you get a chance. Um, so this is a really important grant um, for people, for a workforce that is in, in dire straits right now. Um, and because we uh, relegated it to just people who are making 200% of the federal poverty guideline or lower, um, there's a potential that people's public uh, benefits as well as their medical assistance could be implicated by receiving monies from this grant. And so what this provision does for the purposes of this committee is just make sure that for um, income or monies received as a part of this grant, it wouldn't count against uh, uh, your medical assistance eligibility. So that is really the gist of the bill. It is something that we're hoping to pass as soon as possible. We have our contractor waiting to um, administer these funds um, and certainly people anxious to get, to get them. 
um, so that we can help retain um, that important workforce. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Graham. Uh, which, I, do we need clarification on which section we're, we're discussing? Just want to make sure people know which. I, maybe it wasn't 20. Yeah, it is. I'm sorry, it's section 45, Madam Chair. Okay. Because it's, it's amending right. session law from 2021. I apologize. Here. It says section 20 on my notes right here. So I yeah. love it. Everybody's laughing at that one. Uh oh. Did we read that you the wrong, wrong stuff? At... <laughs> That's why everybody was looking at us so odd. Like, you're not talking about what section 20 is. Yeah. They were, Do you want me to they start all over section... again? No, that's okay. I will. We, no, I think we're okay. I think now we, we know where we're oriented. We all know which section we're supposed to be talking about, and we can find it. So. Thank you. So, um, members, do you have any questions about Section 45? Senator Abler. Uh, thanks, Madam. Senator Hoffman, is this a good section? It's, it's absolutely, you know, uh, Madam Chair. Senator Hoffman. Madam Chair, and to the good Senator from Anoka's point, this is absolutely a great section because it really identifies that workforce development grant modifications, as you know, was passed in 2021. Um, so, yes. Thank you. Senator Abler, any other? Senator Liskey. Thank Senator you, Madam Abler Chair. Was, oh. Senator Hoffman, I think the reason you're having a confusion of Section 20 or Section 45, I look at this, it says Section 45, and then it says colon Section 20 right afterwards, and I think that's kind of a weird labeling going on in the bill, so maybe that's why we're having issues. Um, might be a technical issue. I'm not entirely sure. Maybe it's how you wanted it. Um, just checking on that. I take your word for it that it's a good good section, and you know I'm looking forward to uh, seeing how this will play out. Interesting, Madam Chair, Senator Hoffman. Uh, that's interesting. We're looking at if you look at line 33.12. Oh, by the way, this bill was passed in 2021. It would have been Senator Abler's committee would have done that. You that's and right. I were, were mm -hmm. leads. 33.12, section 45. 33.14. It says section 20 to Senator. Liskey's point, is mm -hmm. that a uh, technical assistance thing that needs to be changed? No? You're good? So, fiscal analyst is assuring me that it's good. <laughs> for, for, what's that? Yes. We just for need further Senator Redke clarification, to ask for a fiscal please note see on that change from fiscal analyst after the meeting, and you can get more clarification. So, um, Senator Hoffman, this bill is going to be referred now to your committee. Yes. Would you like to make the motion to? Yes, Madam Chair, I would like to um, make a motion to uh, uh, move Senate File 1692, Section 45, um, to be re-referred to Human Services. Yeah. I, I can't refer the section. Let me go back and just do that. I would like to re-refer re, uh, re Senate, Senate file 1692 to Human Services. Thank you. M members, on that motion, all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? The motion does pass. The, the bill, or the motion does prevail. Uh, the bill 16, Senate file 1692 is Recommended to pass and being referred to the Human Services Committee. Thank you, Senator Hoffman. Thank you, Madam Chair and members. All right.
And maybe not. That's the one that I think is having problems. So maybe use this one. Welcome to the testifier's table, Madam Chair. Thank you, Senator Morrison. Uh, Chair, um, I will be taking up Senate File 1893, and I do have, I believe, yes, I do have an author's amendment for this bill, the A1, which has that been passed out? That was passed out. And the A1 is just um, a couple of technical corrections mm -hmm. that were made. <laughs> okay. Uh, so members, those in favor of the A1, please say aye. 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 Those opposed, nay. <laughs> do, we, do, we do we have a quorum? <laughs> we, we had a quorum. Yes. Oh, you haven't we, seen we, it. We, Okay, members. Shall we adopt the A1 amendment? No? Okay. Do you need to see it? I thought this was passed out. Oh, you do have that. Okay, we're good. Okay, members, we're going to adopt the A1 amendment so that um, Senator, uh, Madam Chair, <laughs> can get the bill into the form that she wants it. So uh, those in favor of the A1, please say aye. 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 Opposed, nay. Excellent. The amendment passes. Madam Chair, please present your bill. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, this bill is the Children and Family Services Policy Bill from the Department of Human Services. It addresses technical and housekeeping changes needed for statutes governing child protection, child support, uh, the Federal Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program, or SNAP. And uh, I can go through the provisions, but actually Jennifer Sommerfeld is here from the department to actually talk about um, the sections in the bill more in more detail. So I think I will turn it over to her to describe them. Great. Please state your name for the record and proceed with your testimony. Thank you, Madam Chair, members of the committee. Um, so this bill is very short which I hopefully you've seen that. Um, and it's very technical and housekeeping, as Representative or Senator Wickland said. Um, the first section simply aligns um, effective dates for payments through what's called the, um, I have to read this, so Assessment of Parenting for Children and Youth, which is also called the MAPC, is for children who are in foster care and who've been adopted from foster care. Um, it aligns those effective dates with current practice so that we have um, a clean process. Um, section two, clarifies who is to be included in a relative search when a child is in foster care. Uh, the way the statute is currently drafted, it would seem to, um, it could be interpreted to not include a child's adult relatives, but rather only include adult relatives of a child's sibling. So that was not what's intended when we changed that statute um, a couple of years ago. So that's just a cleanup piece. Um, section three eliminates a, uh, a cross-reference that's no longer effective, the statute that it cross-references is no longer in Minnesota law. Um, section four, as amended by the A1, uh, clarifies um, a deviation statute for child protection. Uh, right now, it would appear to uh, prohibit the court, or allow the court to uh, deviate from a child support guideline if child support would go down uh, because a uh, recipient's income went up and there was no change in the payers. Um, and the goal of that statute was to allow for a deviation if the child support was going to increase due solely to an increase in the recipient's income, but not a change in the payers. Um, section five is a repealer, and it covers two repealers. One is an obsolete statute for the SNAP program. Um, it's a statute that is uh, no longer aligned with federal law, and as you know, SNAP is a federal program. Uh, so federal law is actually what controls, so we're just repealing that. And the other one is uh, repealing a section of law that would relate to notices of interest on child support, and that is also obsolete because we no longer charge interest on child support in the child support program. So that is it. Thank you, Ms. Sommerfeld. Members, questions, discussion, amendments? <laughs> 
Okay. Very good. Then the final comments, Senator Wicklund? No, I, I think, you know, to, tonight we're taking up several of the DHS policy bills. They're um, items that they have brought forward in, in these bills that they would like to see happen. And um, if members have questions, that's great. But I, um, you can see where they're fairly, these are technical and if you don't have any questions, we, we can move on to the next bill. Okay, great. So Senate file 1893 as amended will be laid over for possible inclusion. Madam Chair, I'm hearing that this is, needs to go to judiciary. It does not any longer need to go to judiciary. Uh, Senator Wickland, I'm being told that it does no longer needs to go to judiciary. Thank you. Okay. Senator, Senator Wickland, would you like to present your next bill? Senate file 2356. This one does another okay. DHS policy bill. Okay, this one I'm not sure about. Let me try to counsel again. So, Madam Chair, um, this is the a policy bill from the, <clears throat> excuse me, from the Office of Inspector General, and I, it has to do with child care, um, foster care, child care training, and some other items that are all included in here. And I have a testifier who is here to actually she has a can walk through the the provisions in this. Bill. Okay, <laughs> perfect. Please state your name for the record and proceed with your testimony. Good evening, everyone. My name is Autumn Baum, and I am the Legislative Director for the Office of Inspector General at the Department of Human Services. So this bill addresses critical safety gaps in child foster care by, number one, consolidating all the training requirements for licensed foster care providers into a new section of staff. Excuse me. I'm sorry to interrupt. Could you get cl either closer to the mic? It yeah, speak directly into it. Thank you very much. Sorry about that. And number two, requiring license holders to notify the licensing agency if there are any changes to their physical or behavioral health that may impact their ability to care for a foster child. And number three, by making technical corrections to child foster care background studies. This bill also clarifies annual review requirements for licensed and certified child care programs, incorporates work group recommendations around protecting sleeping infants in licensed settings, adds language that requires initial and annual training on child maltreatment reporting, makes modifications to standards for license-exempt certified child care centers, and aligns family child care licensing regulations with state fire code. This bill also includes language that requires all county family child care licensors to use the electronic licensing inspection checklist information to log information collected during a licensing review or investigation. It creates a reconsideration process if a child care provider believes that the contents of a correction order are in error. And finally, protects the confidentiality of reporters who provide tips in good faith regarding child care assistance program fraud. Thank you for your testimony. Members, discussion, questions? Okay. Senator Wickland. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, yes, yeah, so this is um, another policy bill. If, people, if members do not have any questions, um, we can move forward. I think there are some important um, child care related items in here, and I, I'm supportive of having these move forward this session. So I appreciate your support. Thank you, Madam Chair. So Senate File 2356 will be laid over for possible inclusion. Thank you. Senator Wicklund, on to your next bill. Thank you, Madam Chair. This bill um, is one that is not introduced yet, but we have the language, and we wanted to go through the presentation tonight on an informational basis, and then when, we, um, when the bill gets introduced, which we believe will be next week, then we can take it up and, <clears throat> and have a brief <coughs> excuse me, brief hearing um, to pass it out to, it needs to go to judiciary. So we will want to get it moving on its way to judiciary soon. 
So um, this bill is also from the Office of Inspector General, and it addresses critical safety gaps in the child foster care system. Um, it, oh, that's it. Uh, oh, okay. I have the wrong. I will just, again, briefly talk about what's in the hi highlights of the bill. It makes policy changes to statutes guiding the Office of Inspector General's work in program licensing, background studies, and program integrity. So I will let um, uh, Ms. Baum uh, actually go into more detail about all of the provisions in the bill. Thank you. Please state your name again for the record and proceed with your testimony. Again, Autumn Baum with the Department of Human Services Office of Inspector General, um, uh, Legislative Director. Um, regarding the licensing area of the Inspector Office of Inspector General, this bill expands the requirement that DHS license programs document the first date of direct contact for new staff. It makes mul multiple modifications to Chapter 245A to align with past statutory changes and current practice and to provide additional clarity for license holders. It adds a licen ho license holder's email, excuse me, it adds a license license holders email to the list of publicly available data like name, address, and telephone number. The bill adds a prohibition for all types of prone restraints for an additional number of programs and services. And finally, this bill ensures final licensing sanctions on a license are not taken before an investigation into a serious incident is complete. Regarding background studies, this bill also seeks to provide clarity to the background studies services at DHS the updates to Chapter 245C in this bill will add clarity and um, uh, will add and clarify study requirements and DHS authority to conduct background studies for various provider types, address the Bureau of Criminal Apprehension and Federal Bureau of Investigation concerns with the sharing of background study data, and comply with the data sharing principle of minimum necessary. Regarding program integrity, Enhancing DHS, DHS's efforts around program integrity, this bill will streamline and clarify the reconsideration process for medical providers and hospitals who request reconsideration or an appeal of a decision that an inpatient hospital service was not medically necessary. This bill will require that records are presented at the time they are requested and that they will be deemed inadmissible if offered later. This bill also allows DHS to request and receive records by mail, fax, or through a secure electronic transfer, and removes the requirement for an affidavit of mailing in addition to certified mail. Finally, this bill clarifies the medical service providers who fraudulently bill for services are under similar investigatory or investigative authority as other medical providers. And I just also wanted to share that is our understanding that the Minnesota Hospital Association has several concerns with some language in several sections of the bill related to the program integrity provisions. We understand those concerns and have every intention to work with MHA on amending the language to address those. So thank you. Thank you for your testimony. And I believe that um, Mary Krinke is here from the Minnesota Hospital Association to testify. Please come to the table. State your name for the record and proceed with your testimony. Madam Chair and members of the committee, for the record, my name is Mary Krinke and I'm with the Minnesota Hospital Association. And I just want to start out by saying we have been working with DHS. Um, they came to one of our meetings at, uh, at the Hospital Association. They shared the language with us. We've been going through concerns with them and all in all, uh, we, we're pledged to keep working on it with them. Who doesn't love a DHS policy bill, you know? so. Uh, so with that, I just have a couple things I would like to put on the record for the committee. Um, first of all, I, I know you all know this, but um, the medical assistance program pays hospitals at about 70 cents on the dollar's worth of cost. So we don't believe there's a great deal of overutilization in uh, medical assistance services from the hospitals. Um, with that, I know that the Department does need to review uh, claims, and there are occasions when maybe there is a situation where things are deemed not to be medically necessary. I just want to point out that those are claims uh, for medical services that have been ordered by physicians, um, advanced practice registered nurses, and PAs. So we don't believe that this is a big problem. That said, a couple concerns that we have is that 
right now there is an appeal process in place for a claim that is denied, and they want this to go to a medical review agent, which is not necessarily bad, but the medical review agent is hired by the department. And so we've been trying to get a handle on how many cases this is, and we've requested information on how many times are claims denied due to medical necessity, and how many times do hospitals make those appeals? And this would apply to other providers. I mean, we're just curious, and we've been trying to calibrate our concern based on how many times this happens. So I don't want to say that we're necessarily opposed to this language. We just want to know how big of a problem it is. So that's our first issue. And the second one's a smaller one, and it is in, but it's actually big for us. It's in section 42, lines 51.24, and it says that records would have to be made immediately available upon request. And it, you know, we have um, at the hosp hospitals have um, records that are kept very secure, and you have to find those records, you have to locate them, you have to scan them. And industry standards is usually 30 days. So we would um, request that that language be changed too. So we're working with the department, but I just want to point those problems out, and we really would like to get the data on how many claims are denied, and how many times appeals occur. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Senator Hoffman, did you have a question? Many questions. Um, I know this is informational only, um, but there is a provision. If you look at line 35.16, section 27, down to 35.17, we had a conversation a couple years ago about um, in the child care world. I know this isn't child care world. This is subject something else, subject matter. But there's non-permissive language. You got somebody, if the background study is 17 years of age or younger, shall provide fingerprints and a photo only as required in subdivision 5A. I am, I guess maybe I'm confused I'm confused. If, does that language not fit? I mean, can somebody help me understand what you're trying to accomplish here by adding that new language in there? And then um, I will respond to our hospital association. Um, Senator Wickland or DHS, who wants to take that? I do not have the language in front of me, and I do not have the answer to your question. We do have staff here from background studies, but um, we would have to actually take your question back and look at the language and try to understand what, um, what, what the concern is or what your question is, and I could just respond back. And email that. That's fine. As long as you, Madam Chair. Senator. Great. Thank you. As long as you're going back, then also have, there's a 144G notation in here as well. And, and we know some of the inconsistencies that we have when we moved 144G. I mean, there's just, it's, it's a work in progress, right? I mean, don't personalize anything, please. Although if you worked for an HMO, you can be more than happy to personalize because I'll just have fun with that comment. Um, thank you. Um, but if you could go back to it, and maybe as a follow-up, I don't know, um, Madam Chair and Senator Wickland, you're planning the disposition of this, you're going to get some numbers to it and then attach it, what, second, third line? What's your plan with this piece? So well, how much urgency do I need to have? Madam Chair, this, this bill does need to go to the Judiciary Committee, so we were hoping that once it gets introduced, then we would we would take it up and we'd have to have have it heard and pass it out to the Judiciary Committee. So Senator I don't Hoffman? know if you can, um, if you can give me the page and line reference so that we make sure they know where your questions are yep. located. Yep. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I guess the other thing Senator too is, Hoffman. thank you, Madam Chair, Senator Wickland. They also at 36.3, when you look at there's more provisions of 17 ages or younger, then it highlights going back to the must language: provide commissioner set of background study subjects classable fingerprints and photographs on minors. I'm, I'm having a, there's a conflict I'm having and I don't know why I'm having that, but you're shaking your head. So maybe you guys will just get back to me on that. Um, and, and as far as the comment about 
is it needed regarding uh, how many people get denied uh, a something from an HMO? Um, I know we don't make uh, legislative according to anecdotes, but why should a person have to spend their life? I just got off the phone with, actually it was a Zoom call, with a, a family, right? Um, and, and the, uh, just say the family's pretty well connected in the community, right? And um, there's really nothing for them, for their child uh, outside after he turns 21, but in the process, every time they turn around, they're getting denied um, the needs that they have for their child, who has multiple. I mean, it doesn't matter. I'm not going to throw a label out there, but it's really um, frustrating for me to always have to turn around and say, why is it that we always have to fight the system in order to get something that is medically necessary? It should take one person to say it's medically necessary and then get out of our way kind of thing, right? Um, the appeals process is terribly broken in this state, and that's not your issue. I mean, I, and so I'm glad that you're raising the point where you get the hospital association saying, you know, oh, we have concerns. Well, great. I'm glad you have concerns, and then fix it. It's the same thing we said to the HMOs this morning, right? Um, don't come and tell me it's going to cost extra money when you're paying millions of dollars in benefits. Uh, I wish Dr. Mann was here because I'm stealing her her punchline about the millions of dollars that goes out, right? Um, it's really frustrating as a policymaker to really kind of sit back and see that happen. So um, how can I help you with, with this process through? Just, you know, get back to me on the, the 17 and younger because I'm having some kind of conflict in there. Um, Senator Wickland, that's basically the, the just of my um, um, concerns or comments in there, and that would be helpful for me. So thank you. Senator Hoffman, was there a question in there? No, the question, Madam, Madam Chair, is actually, I think she gets it. We're coming back. The H-17 allocations, and there's some allocation notations of 144G, which is when you start to say, well, now we're processing in 144G, which is a licensing authority over, we got the old customized housing with services group home. Let's go down that rabbit hole. But, but I think that we can do this offline. They can come back to me before this actually bill becomes to the committee. Does that make sense? Very good. Yes, sir. Senator Leskey. Thank you, Madam Chair. Madam Chair, Senator Wickland, um, I am reading through and I do now see what uh, the hospitals have brought forward. Uh, as a healthcare provider and owner of my own clinic, I am concerned reading through some of this as a immediately upon request. Uh, I, hate, I hate to say it, but uh, mail doesn't always get to people's offices and a lot of times that's how the requests come in. Um, I can attest to that I live in a small town. My clinic is in a small town. Uh, I've gotten mail 60, 90, 120 days after the mail was actually sent, which is really quite sad, to be honest. Uh, I picked up a piece of mail and was like, this is months old and they're requesting records. It's kind of hard for me to re answer them if I don't have this in hand. So the word immediately is concerning. Um, I think the standard of, of process is normally 30 days, uh, as mentioned previously. So I don't know if we can change the language in there to match that, if you'd be open to that. Um, but that's definitely something I'm concerned about. Maybe you can answer that. Senator Wickland or Ms. Baum? Madam Chair, Senator Liskey, I, I don't have an answer, but I, I think what you're pointing out seems like a fair request to get more information about how that, that wording was developed and what does it mean in terms of a standard of immediately? That does seem very strict. So um, I don't know if you have any more. I think Ms. Baum is going to take that back and take back the hospital's concern. And then when we have a discussion again in the committee, um, I should have an update on what, what's to be done if there's an amendment or needed or, or not. Thank you, Madam Chair. Other discussion members? So we'll, we will revisit this bill after it's introduced. Right. Okay. Yes, and Madam Chair, the revisor's office, it, it sounded like it should be in our possession in the next day or two. So we should be able to get it introduced next week. Great. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, do you have another bill? Or does that conclude your bills, I think? I think that's it. Mm -hmm. Senator Hoffman. Thank you, Madam Chair. I just see this, and, and maybe you could come back and help me understand um, the department on 
record requests inadmissible if offered as evidence preceding contest sanctions against monetary recovery from the provider. Is that, in, is that inducing in a lawsuit kind of side of that? Is, that? is that getting to the fact that some of these HMOs don't like to give up their information in a timely manner due to the fact that there might be some kind of lawsuit against them? Senator Wicklund, Ms. Baum, we are in fact not done with this bill. <laughs> <laughs> Madam Chair, Senator Hoffman, um, I can, do you know, do you have a line reference for this provision? I do, Madam Chair. Madam Chair? Senator Hoffman. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, 51.23, um, it gives reference to the great umbrella of 256B, but that goes all the way down to 51.27. But specifically, there is that proceedings to contest sanctions against or monetary recovery from the provider. I, some lawyer wrote that language in there, and you know, is it, if if the HMOs, if this is because you got problems with HMOs taking their time to get records released, then I can see why this is important, um, and I would wholeheartedly support that. So maybe you can get back to me about what the reason is on that. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Hoffman. Okay, should we move on to, thank you, Senator Wickland. Thank you, Ms. Baum. Senator Bolton, you're up. Senator Bolden, to your bill. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I do have an author's amendment, the A1, that I would like to offer. Okay. That amendment will be passed out. I'm just looking for my copy of the bill. Thank you. Um, and I don't know if we want to just uh, adopt this amendment, yes. and then I can sort of walk through the entire bill. We can... We can do that, um, and then, yeah, as you go through the bill, and Ms. Graham will be able to walk through the whole, the bill. Um, members, this is the author's amendment, the A1 amendment. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? The amendment is adopted. Senator Bolden. Thank you, Madam Chair and members. So this is a DHS policy bill that makes clarifications and technical changes to statutes that govern DHS um, housing and healthcare programs. There are five main changes in this bill. First, the bill aligns um, application requirements for general assistance, housing support, and Minnesota supplemental aid with other public assistance programs, such as the Minnesota Family Investment Program, or MFIP, and the Diversionary Work Program, DWP. Second, this bill clarifies the definition of supportive housing to align with current practice and specifies that multi-tribal collaboratives are eligible for the Community Living Infrastructure Grant. Third, this bill codifies several mental health grants as required by the uh, 2021 legislature to ensure program integrity and clarity for organizations seeking grant opportunities. Fourth, this bill relocates the medical assistance room and board rate provisions to the MA eligibility statute. Um, it's currently under the housing support statute, but fits better under the MA program as the name suggests. Lastly, um, in the amendment, it clarifies that uh, MA covers gender affirming services. And uh, Christy Grom is here from DHS to answer questions and uh, provide a quick section by section overview if that is of interest to members. Welcome back to the table. Um, Ms. Graham, if you introduce yourself and begin your testimony. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, Senator And you have to pull that microphone closer, I think, because it's... Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, That's and thank better. you, Senator Bolden. Uh, Christy Graham with the Department of Human Services. So I will um, walk through the sections uh, pretty quickly, but happy to answer questions. 
Um, so sections one through nine are related to mental health grant codification. So as Senator Bolden mentioned, this is um, in part related to a direction from the 2021 legislature um, to codify um, certain adult mental health grants um, and to make sure that we're um, clarifying what the eligibility criteria are, what the outcome measures are, um, and allowable uses of funds. Um, and this is something that we felt was very important just from a program integrity perspective and making sure that organizations have clarity, um, especially those small BIPOC organizations who might um, want to um, be seeking uh, funding under many of these grants. Um, sections 10 through 13 and 27 uh, relate to that medical assistance room and board um, reorganization that Senator Bolden mentioned. So the MA room and board rate provision is currently in the housing support statute. Last session when we were doing some work around this, we found that it really um, fits better in MA statute. So this is um, just really a pure organ reorganization, no substantive changes there. Um, sections 14 to 15, 17 through 19, and 21 to 25 um, are related to program integrity. And so this is just um, making sure that our, our um, public cash assistance programs all have the same application standards. So in 2021, following um, some success with some flexibilities that we um, instituted during the, the pandemic, um, the legislature passed some flexibilities so that um, MFIP and DWP um, people could apply via telephone or telepresence, and then there were certain other requirements that were put in statute around when um, the signature needed to be received from the person in order to continue those benefits. That's been a huge success. Um, we want to make sure that we're supporting counties and people with um, streamlining all of the requirements for our program. So this would just align um, uh, Minnesota supplemental aid, housing support, and general assistance with those same requirements. Um, section 16 and section 20 um, is related to some housing program clarification. So uh, we mentioned a, a bit ago, this is just clarifying the definition of supportive housing. Supportive housing under um, housing support are those settings where people generally live in their own home or their own apartment, they have a lease there, um, and then there's a, a inspection required. Um, and we just wanna make sure with some of the changes around assisted living licensure, um, we wanted to just clarify that, this, um, that the definition doesn't include assisted living. And then community living infrastructure, this is a grant that really important grant for tribes um, as well as counties that helps support administrative work that tribes or that local agencies are doing to um, help people find and keep housing. Um, it also provides resources for outreach so to connect people with medical care, um, mental health care, as well as housing resource specialists to help people um, get all of their affairs in order to access housing. Um, and right now we are leaving out a term uh, multi um, collaborative uh, uh, tribal and multi-tribal collaboratives as eligible grantees and they it's just something that we should be adding in um, it's um, already allowed in the language of the bill or in the language of the statute but something that we need to clarify for equity um, and I believe that is the entirety of the bill and we're happy to answer any questions madam chair Senator Hoffman. Thank you. I just understood that this is a clone of a, of a bill because I was looking at all this stuff and I'm going, uh, Madam Chair, that this. Um, I question there are so many um, notations in here that should almost fall under the jurisdiction of you. What's, the, what's your disposition of this bill? Because all of a sudden you got, you got the peer recovery specialist in here on the mental health side, you have the room and board people, aged, disabled, that's, I hate that term, but it's in the, it's in statute, we need to change that, but um, um, deaf and hearty, I mean, there's the, con the confusion to me is, this all of a sudden fits in um, with those things that should be under human services. I, uh, especially you got 60 days for people with disability, aged or blind, um, Help me understand why this sits over here. Is it because of the grants? Um, is it because it sits under grants? or And what's the disposition of this? Who's going to cover this? How can I get some? Because uh, there's, and I'm going to go back, and I may be sounding fragmented because this is the first time I'm really taking a peek at nobody's approached me on these conversations. And so, Madam Chair, 
Senator Hoffman, we were planning to just to lay it over. We can discuss. I'm not sure how. I mean, the I think that council reviewed and maybe DHS had reviewed and decided how to divide up these bills. I'm not sure I have all the information about that. And maybe Ms. Grom, I don't know if you have any further information. Um, Madam Chair, Christy Grom with the department. Uh, I, I don't. I mean, we had discussions with staff on this. I know I did share the description of the bill with, um, with Chair Hoffman, but I would be happy to um, review this bill in your committee as well if that's, um, if that's your prerogative. Madam Chair. Senator Hoffman. Thank you. There are only certain aspects of this bill that I think belong in, in, in the jurisdiction of our committee. You know, the mental health certified peer specialist, the, uh, the assistance in transitioning from homeless because of the fact you're dealing with individuals that are uh, people with disabilities. You've got some medical assistance room and board fits into that aspect as well. Medical assistance on um, those pieces. And then again, getting to... Um, popping into the behavioral aid services, all of a sudden you're into the behavioral aid, behavioral services bucket, and I know it's a dream of yours, not a dream, but a wish, a goal of yours to look at the defragmentation of our behavioral health umbrella. We had a great bill last year that would have plucked it out and put it as its own commission, but I'm not going to go there, but you have the peer substance use, peer mental health, yet what are we doing to assure there's some integration or something? I know that's something that you've been working on for years. And so there are pieces of this bill I think that should be in human services. Some of it should be in yours, right? That's just where I'm adding. And I don't know what to do about that if maybe we can talk. As you, you like you said, you're going to lay this over. Maybe that's a conversation. I mean, Senator Hoppen, yeah, we can. I mean, if we lay it over, if, if we make a different decision, then we can take it up again and do take some other action if you would like we can talk through yeah we can talk about it. I talk. think madam chair too to that end too there's also like there's a provision of a of a bill that it's in the house it's following the human services trend line which stays in you know representative Noor's bucket which then fit in my bucket but for some reason it was referred on that line over there, but it's mm -hmm. referred through you over here, and I think it actually should come back to me anyway. I mean, those Let's, conversations, I think you and I need to yeah. actually sit down and have that conversation. So with that, I'll just not ask any more questions on it and just say that this is, it's nice to see you ad ad addressing the peer stuff that you've talked about for years in here. So uh, let me know what I can do to help. So thank okay. you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Any other questions? Senator Liskey. Thank you, Madam Chair. Madam Chair, uh, Senator Bolden, with this A1 amendment, now that we're offering more services, is there a fiscal note going to be uh, applied to this? Is it going to be changing how much we're charging for these things and how much is coming to the state? Senator Bolden. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you for the question. Um, I Please correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe the answer is no, because this isn't actually changing the practice. This is... Um, this is already occurring. DHS is already following this. This and the change. This change is due to a 2016 uh, court decision, which has ruled what is currently in statute unconstitutional. So um, DHS is is currently complying with that. So the what's actually happening isn't going to change. We're just changing what is listed in statute. All right. Thank you. Sorry, Madam Chair. That's no, that's okay. Any other questions, members? No other questions. Seeing no other questions, um, Senator Bolden, thank you for presenting the bill. We will lay this bill over thank for future Chair. consideration. Thank you. And seeing no other work before us, we are adjourned.